enjoy it. If you guys have any questions throughout, just um, just like raise your hand and I'll take them and uh, relay them to Doug. This is a Use the microphone and we can like come up to you oh true yeah maybe we can even like come up to you and like hand you off a microphone if you want yeah but yeah welcome doug yay well thanks for thanks for having me here uh my name is doug i am uh, currently in cleveland ohio which makes it about 11 16 p.m my time um you're lucky because i'm kind of a night owl so that's uh that that's not a huge deal but set your expectations appropriately low for what's about to happen for the next hour because I normally go to bed about an hour from now. So the setting that setting that expectation appropriately, I hope. Um, I work for a company called Chisel Strike um, mm -hmm. and we recently um, released a beta version, a public, a free public beta version of our database Terso. Um, I think the easiest way to talk about Terso is just to get right into um, a definition. So if I had to define Terso, and this is what I wrote in the documentation. So I, if you go to docs.terso.tech, you'll see um, a lot of writing there about how things work. Uh, my definition of Terso is uh, it's an edge hosted distributed database um, based on LibSQL an open source and open contribution fork of SQLite. Now, that's a lot of stuff there. If you know most of these things, this probably makes a ton of sense to you. But since you're kind of doing a, 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 a introduction to programming class, a lot of these things are probably foreign to you. So I think the easiest way to, to think about what Terso is, is to break down each of these terms. So the first thing I'd like to talk about is the fact that um, this is edge hosted. So uh, what does it mean for Terso to be an edge hosted database? Um, well, the easiest way to understand what the edge is, is actually to understand where we where we came from before we had the edge. So if you look at like a traditional client server um, application architecture, which is probably, I think is what you learned in this class right now, uh, which is appropriate for small to medium sized applications. You have um, a user using some device, a phone, a laptop, or whatever, um, and in the process of using the web application, eventually there will be an HTTP request which goes to a web server. Um, that web server goes to a database. Um, and in your class, I believe you learned uh, the React framework for the web application. Uh, for your HTTP server, you learned um, Express running on Node.js, and for your database, you learned MongoDB. Um, now, what I'm going to talk about is actually very, uh, very different. Th well, not very different than this, but um, th in a traditional application architecture, you have an app, you have the app, the user of the app making HTTP requests to your node server. So that's the first hop uh, to to fulfill the request. Then on the second request or the the second leg is to make a database query. So if the user is doing something that requires some database um, data, you're going to have to make a database query. You're going to have to come back. Uh, from the database to collect the information in your HTTP server, and then you're going to have to bundle that back up and send it back to the uh, web application. Uh, so that's sort of like the round trip of a single request. And this is the kind of thing that we're that we're trying to optimize. So traditionally, uh, the round trip latency would be the sum of all of these parts. So one plus two plus three plus four. And actually, if you're if you're making multiple queries, parts two and three might get repeated several times. So it's maybe one plus two plus three plus two plus three plus four, uh, plus any sort of plus any sort of uh, processing on the web server or on the database is what we call the round trip latency for that request. Uh, the round trip latency is basically what the user perceives to be the speed of your website. So if your if your express is running quickly and your database is running quickly, that's great. But it's the time it takes to round trip the data is what the user perceives as the speed. And that's what we're trying to improve here by um, creating an edge hosted database. Uh, so how how bad is the latency? Well, that really depends on the distance between the clients and the servers. Uh, the distance matters a lot, actually. It's the single most important um, uh, factor in determining the sort of perceived behavior of your application, assuming your web server and your database are both very, very fast. So imagine you have a situation where you've dropped a, a server and a database. So the database is the cylinder and the web server is the sort of stack of three things. You've dropped, uh, you've dropped something in the Midwest that would be about kind of where I live right now, Indiana, Ohio area. Um, this would, in, in cloud terms, this would be kind of a U.S. East region. Um, and say so you have a couple of users. Uh, one is in around California, and another one is in Canada. 
Um, it looks to me from a pure distance point of view that the, that the user in Canada is going to see better performance, generally speaking, because the distance between them and the server is a little bit uh, closer than all the way to California. Um, but since this is all happening in the same continent, it's still going to be pretty fast for both of them, I think. You wouldn't have too many perceived performance problems. The round trip latency will be generally pretty good. Um, but if you expand this to something that extends across the world, and you know, a lot of people are building applications that are meant to be used worldwide, uh, what happens then if you have users uh, all of a sudden who are coming at you from South America, and that would be around Brazil, um, and then other people in India? And of course, they would be all over, but let's just take those two locations in particular. Uh, the, the round trip latency for them would be much, much worse, especially for users in India and throughout the European continent because uh, of a transoceanic link. The moment you start sending network traffic over an ocean, things get really bad because uh, oceanic, the cables that run under the ocean are not terribly fast. It's just, you're running up against, you know, basically the physics of the speed of light. You can't make the speed of light go any faster. That's the theoretical maximum that you can transfer data at, um, or even worse, someone might be over a satellite link. Um, so how do you improve the perceived performance of people who are away from your web server and your database. Uh, well, that's what the edge is. So if you define, if you want to define what is the edge um, or edge computing, that would be, and this is Wikipedia's definition, edge computing is a distributed computing parad paradigm that uh, brings computation and data storage closer to the sources of data. This is expected to improve response times and safe bandwidth. Uh, the important parts of this definition are the sources of data, which is actually the users. The users are actually providing the data for your app. Um, and when you move the users closer to your computation and data storage, you can improve the response time, so the round trip latency. So if you're very concerned about latency, which a lot of applications are, not all of them, but a lot of them are, especially if you have a globally distributed audience, uh, you probably want to look at putting your compute and your storage on the edge. So there's different kinds of edge terminology that we might talk about. So the, the first kind of edge that came around uh, might today be called the far edge, at least that's what we call it at Chisel Strike. So the far edge uh, would be as far removed as you can get from centralized computing uh, and networks. So this includes things like um, Internet of Things devices, so it's called IoT for short. Uh, with IoT, you have things like wearables um, and all your home smart devices. Your toaster could be an Internet of Things device, your refrigerator, um, your mobile phone could be considered uh, something that lives at the far edge. That, that device can go really anywhere. Um, uh, point of sales uh, kiosks could be considered far edge. Um, what all these things generally have in common is that they could have limited network capacity, if not completely offline most of the time. So on the far edge, uh, you're dealing with very limited network capacity, possibly even very limited uh, computation and uh, local resources. Um, and in this situation, for these devices to continue to work normally, and, uh, and mobile devices are a ex good example, if your mobile device loses connectivity, you kind of still expect it to behave like a phone. Maybe you don't make phone calls with it, uh, but you, it, you still expect apps to launch. You expect to be able to read your data. You, you probably even expect to write your data, even though you're not online. Um, and in these kind of situations, caching data on the device is very important. So a cache kind of acts as like a very, very local storage. It's this, this, you're putting the storage, using the storage in the device in order to improve the user experience uh, because you just don't know that they have uh, a good data connection. Now, the, uh, the other kind of edge, the newer kind of edge uh, that you find popping up um, in networks around the world is called what we call the near edge. So with the near edge, you have, um, you have uh, data and computational services uh, and infrastructures at individual locations. So um, in, if you go back to the example with the map, the, the data and computational service was located in the Midwest of the US. So that would be potentially one edge location of many um, that could be throughout the world. Uh, so some examples of actual near edge services would be content delivery networks or CDNs. Uh, chances are really good that you that you use a CDN every day and you just don't know it. Uh, if you continue uh, doing web development as you have so far in this class, you will definitely encounter a CDN because these are the things that uh, copy your static resources in your app and push them all over the world for users to uh, have very fast access to. So your HTML, your CSS, 
uh, your JavaScript, your images, all of that content that doesn't change once you've built your app is uh, is qualified for use on a CDN. Um, and then users access that, that static content on your CDN directly. Um, another near edge uh, service would be considered edge functions, or sometimes uh, you could it would be called serverless. Uh, with edge functions, you're basically putting the computation on the edge. So like your web server or any sort of um, functions or code that you call as part of running your application, that could be something that lives on the edge as well. Uh, but both of these have in common is that they're mostly deployed on what I would call commodity hardware. So with commodity hardware, uh, basically you have limited memory and CPU. So nothing like what your laptop is like. The, your, your laptop is probably more powerful than a lot of commodity hardware that runs these near edge services. Uh, there might not even be a writable disk attached to that machine. So any sort of data persistence would have to come from another network service on another machine. Uh, these computers are easily replaceable. So the idea is you can scale up a data center very easily by putting hundreds and thousands of copies of the same piece of hardware in a data center. And if something goes bad, you just yank it out and put in a new one. Uh, they're super cheap, basically. So these near edge services can scale basically by putting super cheap hardware all around the world and copying your data and code to it. So if we go back to that example where we have compute, uh, where we have users throughout the world, um, the idea is you want to put both your compute and your data near the edge or near your users. Uh, and we're already doing this sort of thing with web servers. So you can make a copy of your web server and stick it close to your users. And now the, the latency between the end user's device and the web server is very low or minimized uh, because they're physically close together. But the problem is if you only replicate your web server, your web content, uh, you still just have the one database. So if your web server needs to query the database in order to service a request, you're still making this transoceanic link all the way to your one copy of your database. Um, and so you, you still haven't really solved the latency problem all around. You might've solved it for some things, but not for everything. Uh, so the trick here is actually to replicate the database and put copies near the web servers where the queries are happening. Um, ideally, you, you fully replicate your database. And now what you have is uh, each user, wherever they are, is kind of using this locally uh, available version. You can almost think of it like a cache, like in, like in the IoT um, and the uh, mobile phone example. When you're offline, you need that local cache to be ready and available in order to be fast. This is kind of the same thing. We are kind of caching computing resources and caching your data close to where the users are so that they don't have to use expensive uh, transoceanic links. So this is what we call, this, this replication of data is what we call the data edge. Uh, we're kind of coining this term. You won't find it anywhere on our, except on our website, website and some of our blogs right now. But what we call the data edge is basically uh, creating a situation where you have the lowest possible round trip latency uh, by putting your database near the source of the query. So the source of the query in this case is your web server, your application server. So if the user is close to the application server and the application server is close to the database, you have minimized latency between all of them. So that first diagram where you had uh, steps one, two, three, and four, you've minimized the time it takes to do one, two, three, and four, creating a very, very snappy, optimized uh, performance, no matter where the user is, as long as you have an edge location that's near your users. Uh, the idea is to replicate the database to each relevant location. So if you know where your users are, you, you basically replicate to those locations. Um, and there are, you know, people live all over the world and you know, you might know that you have users in some places and not others. So you can kind of selectively choose where you replicate it. And of course, replicate, uh, replicating anything just costs more money. So in order to optimize your costs, you might choose the most relevant locations. Um, now you're thinking, well, you know, if people have already been replicating web servers and using CDNs, how is this new for the data edge? How is this new for databases? Um, haven't we been doing that all along for databases? And the answer to that is no, we actually we haven't. Not a whole lot of databases out there are replicated like Terso is. Um, and the reason for that is there is a couple downsides. First of all, database replication is a very hard problem to solve well, uh, or if you are doing it, it tends to be kind of expensive. Um, so people have kind of shied away from it um, just because of it's, it's, it's difficult to do and it's it's expensive to do. Um, another downside to having replicated data is you have weaker data consistency guarantees. Now, if you're a computer science student, you might see that and say, oh, okay, I can understand what that means. If you're taking this, this class for the first time with no programming background, this is probably kind of a strange thing to say. 
Um, and I won't go into too much detail about this because it starts getting into the computer science details a little bit, but basically what it says is your reads and your writes um, are not all necessarily going to the same place. And so you have there are some issues with the write behavior of your application and the read behavior of your application. There's some, some inconsistencies that you can expect. And once you expect them and know how to deal with them, it's not a problem. Um, but for some applications, this kind of is a problem. Um, if you want to get into the weeds of this, I actually just finished the documentation for Terso's data consistency guarantees. It's on our it's on our documentation site. Um, it, it really gets into the weeds on how the specifics of our chosen database actually works with respect to replication. Um, and I won't say anything about that other than that. Like go to the documentation if you want to know more. Um, but it's a lot of interesting problems to solve in there. Now the data edge, at least the way we define it, runs on the same kind of hardware as the far edge. And if you remember, far edge hardware is that commodity hardware, very, very limited, um, but easily replaceable and inexpensive. Uh, so um, the fact that our data edge, our database, what we call the data edge runs on commodity hardware, places some restrictions on what sort of database you can effectively use. Not all databases work in this far edge or data edge scenario. Some databases have just become very large, and I won't say bloated, but they've just expected to have a lot of CPU and a lot of memory and a lot of local disk and things that you just don't really have on the far edge. Uh, so there's very limited number of database kind of solutions that would work in this scenario. And that's what Terso is trying to solve. Terso is uh, trying to work in this environment where you are in an edge hosted distributed database scenario. So you can kind of get the sense of what Terso is. It's, it's, it's a very small database running on uh, very limited hardware uh, distributed throughout the world. Now, this leads me to the next uh, point is, well, what database are you actually using that's small enough to work on the data edge? Um, the answer to that is uh, we've created our own database called LibSQL, which is a fork of SQLite. Uh, so SQLite forms the foundation of what we're doing, and we've built something called LibSQL around that. Um, now, if you're if you're taking this class and you haven't done any programming yet, you're probably looking at these letters SQL everywhere. Um, that's a good observation. SQL stands for Structured Query Language. Um, you didn't learn this in this class. What you learned is a different database, MongoDB, which does not use SQL. Um, but SQL actually forms the foundation of, uh, of the product and actually most databases. SQL is actually a very, very old language. It's been around for, I don't know, like 50 years now. And it's kind of the gold standard for querying structured data or relational data in particular. So now that you know that there are lots of different databases out there, there's SQL data databases, and then there's whatever MongoDB is, um, you have to kind of ask yourself, if you're building a web application, what sort of database does your app need? And every app has different needs. Um, and in fact, there are more than 300 database products out there. That's kind of overwhelming. Um, so if you're trying to figure out what database is good for the app that I'm building, there's no way you can survey all 300 databases. You kind of just have to know in general how different types of databases perform and then do some research to figure out if the database is right for you. Um, this class, like I said, only taught MongoDB, which is not a SQL database. So I'm going to start talking about SQL a little bit. You, that might be foreign to you. For um, If you're a computer science student, you've almost certainly been exposed to SQL a little bit because I think pretty much every university student learns that at some point. Um, but I will say that uh, if you ask yourself, is MongoDB good for any project? And the answer to that is no. It's good for a lot of projects. It's a good general purpose database, but there are some things it just doesn't do as well as a SQL database. Uh, so I'll say a little bit about that. We have these two categories of databases. We have SQL databases and we have uh, NoSQL. So Mongo would be considered a NoSQL database. Um, there are many other types of databases out there. There's vector databases, there's key value stores, there's graph databases, all, all kinds of things that are very special purpose. Um, but for general purposes, like for building web applications, you generally choose between a SQL or a NoSQL database. So I'll kind of compare them for you. Uh, like I said, Terso is a SQL database, and as a SQL database, you, you structure your data using tables with columns and rows. So you think of it kind of like a big spreadsheet, right? A spreadsheet just has tables and or, uh, uh, rows and columns. So all of your uh, rows indicate an item of data, and the columns indicate the fields of data within each item. Um, and usually you have more than one table, which would, like a spreadsheet, would be more than one tab of a spreadsheet. Uh, NoSQL data databases are very different. You, know, you learn MongoDB. Um, it stores data as a JSON document. You can put whatever you want in that document. You don't have you know, tables with rows and columns. You just have documents with data that looks like JSON. Um, now, with SQL, it's highly structured. 
Um, in fact, it's forcing you into this table rows and columns structure. Um, but as a result, with your data modeling, you end up with generally one correct relational data model. So if you know what your app is supposed to do and you know all the data you're supposed to be dealing with and the relationships between all that, it's possible in, for you know anyone to come up with the same one correct model, assuming you know how to model data correctly. Um, and if you're doing it by the book, you end up with what's called a normalized data structure. And by normalized, you, it, it, all I'm saying is that every piece of data has its place in the database and it's not duplicated anywhere. Whereas NoSQL databases have a very, very flexible data modeling system. So with MongoDB, you, you're just putting JSON in there. You can put whatever you want in, as long as it's JSON data. Um, now, in order to do, in order to build an application well, you might end up duplicating data between some of the documents. So you might have multiple collections with some data duplicated between those collections. When you duplicate data like that, that's called denormalization. And it turns out denormalization is actually quite normal for NoSQL databases. So it's a little bit of a funny term. And I used to work with NoSQL databases a lot. And we'd always have to tell people denormalization is normal. It's the right way to structure your data or a way to structure your data uh, to satisfy the constraints of the system. Now, uh, I'll say a little bit more about this. With SQL, you have highly structured data that requires a very specific kind of data modeling, but you have but the SQL language itself is very flexible. You can do very powerful queries with it. And that's kind of a result of it being a very old uh, query language is that it's built to handle all of these different query cases uh, that people have come up with over the you know years and years and years of using databases. Uh, whereas with NoSQL, you have less, less flexible queries. Um, in fact, many NoSQL databases don't even have a query language at all. They just have an API that you access. Uh, MongoDB is kind of like that. I, I, I Actually, I don't know. I don't know if it has a query language, but I know it has an API that you access to do your filtering and doing, uh, doing your um, uh, ordering and, and things like that. Uh, so you have SQL, which is very, very flexible, very powerful. No SQL, which is less flexible. Uh, so what's what's the bottom line here? Why wouldn't you just choose SQL over no SQL? Well, the problem is SQL databases tend to be difficult to scale. And when you've put a lot of rows into a single table, like when you start approaching millions or even billions of rows, you can expect to see some declining performance. And that's just kind of how SQL databases work. The, the, the power of the language, the flexibility of the query language makes it difficult to scale well and have good performance um, giving you the full flexibility of the query language. However, with NoSQL databases, they tend to be very easy to scale and you can sustain your performance when you add lots and lots of documents to a collection. That's just the way they were, uh, they were constructed. In fact, NoSQL fits a very specific role as you know, what I might call massively scalable databases. And I spent a lot of my career working with these massively scalable databases and people, couldn't un people co who come from a SQL background couldn't understand like, how is this NoSQL database scaling so well? Like, doesn't it, doesn't the performance break down? And the and the answer to that is, it generally does not break down. There are cases where it does, but if your NoSQL database is architected well, you end up with a massively scalable scalable database that's difficult to query. Whereas SQL, you have more flexible querying but less scalability. And I'm painting in very very broad strokes here. There are some SQL da databases that scale very well, um, just in ways that you might not expect. And there are some NoSQL databases that don't scale as well. So what you see in these two columns is painting in very very broad strokes, very generalized uh, information. I'm, I'm telling you this just because if you if you come from a NoSQL background, meaning you, you know you learned uh, MongoDB, SQL might be a little bit confusing to you about why how are they different? Why would I choose? Uh, so let's go into SQLite. So if you recall, Terso is based on LibSQL, which is a fork of SQLite. So SQLite forms the core, the foundation of what Terso is. Uh, SQLite is a fast and small database, and it's embedded directly into applications. Um, and I'll say a little bit more about that, but that's its use case. It's not, it, it's, it's meant to be tiny. So it doesn't scale in the way that you would expect like a MongoDB to scale. Um, but I'll go into how this works a little bit later. So SQLite is actually excellent for far, uh, far edge use cases. So all those IoT devices and mobile devices, SQLite fits very, very well there where you have this sort of uh, limited, um, limited ability to uh, store and retrieve data, limited CPUs, limited connectivity. It's also great for the data edge as well. And that's what I, that, that's the core um, the premise on Terso is that we've chosen SQLite as a great pick for the data edge when you run on this commodity hardware. 
Uh, now, I will say that SQLite is probably the most commonly used database in the world by number of database instances. And I and I say this purely out of speculation, but it's not it, it's it's not a hard leap to get there. The reason is that SQLite is embedded in just about anything. It runs everywhere. Uh, chances are really good if you have an Android or iOS device on you, especially if you have an Android device, you probably have dozens of little databases in the OS and in all the apps that are using that. SQLite forms the foundation of data storage for limited devices like Android and iOS devices. So if you count the total number of databases and considering every Android device has dozens of little databases in it, you're looking at like, you know, trillions of instances of databases really easily just from all of these devices have with all of these apps using all of these tiny little databases. So it's super, super common, super powerful. Powerful. Um, people really like it. Like developers really like it because it's, it, it suits that problem very well. The problem with SQLite, though, um, as far as being a general purpose database, is it doesn't have a server. So if you wanted to, if you wanted to put an instance of SQLite somewhere on a server and query it from your application, you can't do that. It's only an embedded database. Uh, the people who designed it made it very, very clear this is meant to be used for uh, embedded purposes. So they didn't build a server for it. It's just not a use case that they considered. Now, LibSQL, which is what we built at Chisel Strike, is a fork of SQLite. So by fork of SQLite, the word fork basically means is we took a copy of it and we're expanding it from that copy. So when you when you say that a, a fork is a, a, a project is a fork of another project, it's basically based directly off of that second project. So what we did with LibSQL is we added that server mode that was missing from SQLite. Uh, so you can, in fact, now build a, a SQLD. SQLD stands for SQL daemon. Daemon is another word for a background process in Linux. So we added the C server mode called SQLD, and we added HTTP and WebSocket access to it. So now you can query it from your web application. You just set up an instance of SQLD, um, deploy it somewhere, or even run it locally. And now you have a SQLite database that you can query from anywhere on the internet. It also adds replication between SQLD instances. So you can set up a bunch of SQLD instances, configure them all to work with each other. And then uh, what you do is you have one primary and some number of replicas, and the primary will distribute all of its changes to the replicas. So you still have SQLite under the scenes here, but now uh, what you have is SQLite databases subscribing to other SQLite databases, copying all the data that's changing over time. Uh, so that's how we're able to make copies of this all around the world is through this replication. Um, in LibSQL <clears throat> based on top of uh, SQLite. We also added some client libraries for that. So if you wanted to query the database in an easy way from your application, we have client libraries for JavaScript and TypeScript, to, uh, Rust. Uh, we just recently released a, a Python client and we have Go's coming soon. Um, I also did some work on a Java client. So we're gonna have a bunch of language support here. And all of these client libraries are going to talk the language that SQL Deep talks, which is over HTTP or WebSocket. So you don't have to know the underlying protocol. You just use the SDK, bake it into your application and off you go. Another feature we added um, is WASM user-defined functions. Uh, I'm not going to say anything about this because this is a very specialized feature and it's probably, you know, probably out of reach for someone who's just learning programming. Um, but if you, the, the, the basic feature here is that you can add code to the database to be invoked by the database itself. Uh, WASM happens to be a very good choice for this. Um, I won't say anything more about that, but this is a feature that a lot of people like and something that um, actually I need to learn better myself. But maybe the most important thing about LibSQL is it retains its compatibility with SQLite. So that core SQLite database we're actually not really changing it that much. We're just building around it. So if you're already familiar with SQLite um, and its flavor of SQL that it uses and its developer experience, LibSQL actually just adds to that. So if you're already familiar with SQLite, like you know thousands of developers already are, um, you're already kind of familiar with the way LibSQL works. So Terso now is an extension of LibSQL. So LibSQL is a fork of SQLite. Now Terso extends LibSQL. So I should have drawn a diagram. You have, you have SQLite, you have LibSQL, and then you have Terso built on top of that. So Terso is building all of this into one package. Uh, so what Terso adds is automatic configuration and management of those uh, SQLD instances. So um, instead of having to build it yourself and deploy it yourself, Terso will do all that for you. All you do is use the Terso CLI to say, I want to create a new database over there and I want to create a replica and it just does all that for you. You never really know that you're using a SQLD instance. It's all managed. We call that a managed service. 
uh, it adds a CLI for working with the SQL to instances. And I'll show you a little bit about that later if we have time. Oh, and it adds a managed token-based authentication system for client code. So if you're connecting to Terso from a client, um, you can issue tokens to the clients to authorize them to connect. Uh, so you can use the Terso CLI to create tokens, um, and then that authorizes your clients. So you probably don't want any client anywhere on the internet to give uh, to have full access to your database. Instead, you want to give select access to your own authorized clients using this token system. So what you end up now is a uh, is a world where you can plop down um, a database, a SQL D database, not even knowing that it's SQL D. We just call it Terso. So you just say Terso, create an instance in Chicago, create an instance in LA, create an instance in New Delhi, create an instance wherever you want. Well, I would say wherever you want. Uh, we're using a hosted service called Fly.io, and they have thirty some locations around the world. So you can choose from the locations uh, from the hosting service that provides our uh, our, our edge capability. Okay, so we know now that Terso is an edge hosted distributed database based on libsql, a fork of SQLite. There's two other pieces of information in here that um, you might have heard of but aren't familiar with yet. And that's the fact that uh, libsql is open source and open contribution. Uh, you've probably already heard open source. Um, open source basically means that you can use the source code to build and deploy your own instances anywhere. So um, a lot of the world is open source. You know, a lot of the world's operating system, Linux is open source. You can download the source code to Linux, build it yourself and deploy it on the machine. You probably don't want to. That's a lot of work. You typically choose a managed solution. But the point is that all the source code is there for you to use um, any way that you want according to uh, to the MIT license, which is a very permissive license. So um, in fact, if you go to GitHub, if you, if you do a search for libsql GitHub, that'll take you to the source code. You can see everything that's going on in there. Now, open source is actually very important for people who don't want vendor lock-in. Um, now, if you're if you're a student and you haven't worked on sort of like mission critical, you know, paid applications, you probably haven't had to worry about this yet. You're probably just happy using the database that just works for you. Um, in practice, though, uh, a lot of companies invest heavily in one database solution, and they want to keep using that solution, um, but they're worried that if the vendor of that solution goes away for whatever reason, that they lose all of their, they, they basically lose the system that they're working on. Um, with open source systems like this, you don't have a vendor lock-in problem because uh, if you want to build and deploy your own SQL D instances, you can do that if you want. You don't have to use Terso. Terso just makes it really easy to use SQL D. Um, so if you ever got, if, if you ever chose Terso, started working with it, then decided you didn't like us or we went away or for, for whatever reason and you wanted to keep running your system, you could certainly do so by managing SQL D yourself. Uh, the differentiator between libsql and sqlite is that it's open contribution. So with libsql, or with what, what open contribution means is that the project enthusiastically considers contributions from the community. And one of the things we set out to do from the beginning with libsql is enable this contributions from the community. And we have had people um, contribute important features and bug fixes and things like that. So uh, already being a community-oriented product has already um, paid out a little bit to us. And we continue to work with the open source communities to um, get a hold of what, what they think is important to add uh, to LibSQL. Now, it's important to note that SQLite, the thing that LibSQL is built on, is generally not open to contributions. Uh, it's open source. In fact, it, you know, we forked it because it is open source. Uh, but because it's not open contribution, um, there's no way that they would accept the changes we're trying to make. Now, I won't say that SQLite rejects all contributions. Like if you have a bug fix or if you have something that you know fits within their vision of the product, uh, they might work with you to get it added. Um, but generally speaking, you can't just add new features to it and and uh, you know and have them accept it. They they probably won't. So we had to fork SQLite because it's not open contribution. Now, libsql, on the other hand, is, is uh, open contribution. So uh, for all the people in the SQLite community who have been wanting to contribute features and functionality to it, who didn't have a way uh, to do it or had to make their own fork, what we're trying to do is unify all that work into one place and make it the place where communities can come together and improve SQLite by adding features to it. In fact, this is the main reason for the fork. And if you want to read our rationale about this, uh, you can go to libsql.org slash about um, and read a little bit about why we chose to make the fork of uh, SQLite in the first place. Because it was actually kind of a controversial idea because SQLite is a very highly regarded piece of software. And by forking it, 
you know, it's, you're kind of saying it isn't good enough for us. And, you know, it, it wasn't good enough. And we had to do this fork in order to move forward with our plans of making, you know, Terso the edge host replicated database. Um, but anyway, you can read more about our rationale if that's interesting to you. Okay, so now you should have the full definition of Terso under your belt. Uh, Terso is an edge hosted distributed database based on libsql, which is an open source and open contribution fork of SQL Lite. You have the overview of it. Um, I don't know if, it, if the definition means more to you now than it did when we started, but um, that's kind of what we're up to here. Um, and I'll pause now for questions. Um, if you have any questions, please ask them now, because after this, I'm gonna move into, if we have some time, uh, to some live coding and demo. Anyone have any questions about Terso, about SQL versus NoSQL, all the embeds of like LibSQL and then SQLite? We'll try out the mic. We'll see if it works. I heard a voice, but I couldn't make it out very clearly. Could you? Repeat that. Can you please re explain what edge hosted means? They all have to understand. Or edge, for something to be on the near edge. Like this. This he asked, uh, could you please re explain what edge hosting was? Yeah, let me, um, let me jump back to the diagram here. Um, so remember here, we had a situation where your server and your database are in one location, centralized location, and it's slow for people who are far away. So when you when you when you talk about edge hosting, what you're doing is putting copies of your database near where people are. So the edge, this would be the the uh, the, the near edge. Uh, the near edge is basically saying we're going to use computing resources close to where people actually are, and that would be the edge. It, we're, we're pushing that 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 information closer to the users. Um, now, what the data edge is doing on top of that is it's also replicating the data closer to your users. So when we say edge hosted, we're saying we have the option of putting these things close to where people actually are, and not just in one location. Does that kind of make sense? The edge is basically saying pushing compute. Actually, we'll, we'll, we'll go back to the definition of the edge. Edge computing is distributed computing paradigm that brings computation and data storage closer to the sources of data. So in the last diagram, you saw that the, the web server being replicated. That's computation being pushed closer to the users. Uh, when you saw the database being replicated closer to that, that's that's moving data, that's moving your data storage closer to the users. So when anytime you can push all of these resources closer to your users, that's considered edge hosting. Good question. Um, any more questions before I move on? Anything? All right, I think we can see the demo now. Okay, great. Uh, all right, so I'm going to switch to, uh, let's see, stop sharing. Let's see. Okay, can you see my VS code now? Maybe I should make the font a little bigger. Yeah, that good? That, that's good, I think. Okay, great. So right now I'm using VS code in a completely empty directory. Um, so there's nothing here. So we're going to start from scratch. Um, I already have node installed. Um, I have the Terso CLI installed. These are the things that I'm really going to, well, um, okay. So what I'm going to do first is, uh, create a Terso database. Um, actually I already have some databases here. Uh, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to actually destroy the demo database first. I forgot to always reset your demo. That's like classic presenter advice, and I didn't follow my advice here. So, anyway, what I'm going to do, what I'm going to do is, uh, I'm going to do a Terso create uh, a Terso DB create demo. Actually, before I do that, I'm going to do Terso DB locations. What this does is showing me all the locations where I can deploy a database. 
Um, and like I said, these are these are the locations supported by fly.io, which is our hosting service. And you can see it's chosen a default location. Why did it choose Chicago? Well, that's the one closest to me. I'm in Cleveland, Ohio. Um, there's nothing on this list closer to me than that. So it's correctly determined where I am in the world. Uh, so if I do Terso DB create um, demo, what it will do is start to create a database near me in Chicago, two states over. I'm in Ohio, so it's crossing Indiana and uh, going into Illinois. Um, and so it's giving me some commands to show. So I can I can show some information about actually what I'm gonna do first is start up a Terso shell. What the Terso shell does, it allows me to issue SQL statements. So that SQL I was talking about earlier, I'm gonna start using that now. So uh, the SQL for creating a table, um, I'm gonna call it users. Every day, every application has to store users, right? So uh, what I can do here is say, um, I, want every, I want every user to have a unique ID. So I'll make that uh, text. Um, they're going to have an email address, which is also text. And then this, let's just store the number of coins they have. I don't know why, what coins are, uh, but we have coins. So every user is going to have a UID, um, an email address and some coins. And it, I really, what I should do is create some indexes on this, but the data is going to be so small, so it's not going to matter. So anyway, I created that table. Um, I can see it in the list of tables. I can see it in my schema, so you can see the the command that I ran to get that to get the table into place. And now I'm going to insert some data into so insert uh, into users values. Uh, we'll give it one UID, uh, one uh, get at foo.com. and I'm going to start with zero coins. A poor man. Um, I'll create a second user just for fun. Um, why not? Okay, so we have two users in there. So now I can do another command to select star from, from users. So what select does is basically saying, find the table that I created, ask for all of the fields from it. And because there's no filter, it's getting everything. If I wanted to get just one row, I could say select star from users where UID equals 01. This is like pretty basic SQL, right? So I'm get I'm so I'm doing a filter right now based on uh, the UID. I could also filter based on email or coins. I could sort in order. Uh, I, I won't show you the full like power of the SQL language, but just know that insert adds rows to the table. Um, select pulls rows from the table. I'll show you an update also where you can change data in the table. Anyway, I have that. I have that all set. So now I have a database. Um, now I need to know something about the database. Actually, what I'm gonna do first is start creating a node project. So um, I'm gonna run npm init. And what this is, I'll just take all the defaults. What this is gonna do is create a node project right here in this directory. So now I have a package.json. Um, this should be kind of familiar to you. I believe uh, you've done this sort of, same sort of thing. Um, now, because I because I'm uh, I'm an engineer who likes type safety. I'm going to the first thing I'm going to do here is add TypeScript. And I don't know. I think you might have been introduced to TypeScript. I'm a huge fan of TypeScript. Um, I hate JavaScript with a passion, but I like JavaScript a lot. TypeScript is basically just JavaScript with features that add type safety. So it catches bugs before they be, before they catch you. It's super handy. Anyway, I'm going to do npm install. Um, Actually, I'm going to do npm, yeah, npm install the TypeScript. What this is going to do is add TypeScript as a dev dependency. Um, I'm also going to add uh, types node, so I get type uh, checking on node APIs. Okay, so now what I can do here is, actually, I'm going to do another thing. I'm going to, um, to make a directory for source, and I'm also going to npx tsc. So npx is a command that Node provides, or npm provides, to let you run uh, run commands that that are installed with packages. So the TypeScript package comes with a command called tsc, the TypeScript compiler. And what I can do is say I want to start to uh, I want to add TypeScript to my project. You can see it added a ts config here. That ts config is the TypeScript compiler configuration. Um, I do want to change a couple things in here. One is I want to um, tell it to look for source code in the source directory. And uh, I want to put it into build. So right now it's going to look for TypeScript source in source and put it in build when it builds. 
Um, so the first thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to add a new file. I'll call it um, test.ts. TS is for TypeScript, JS is for JavaScript. Uh, and I'm just going to do a console log. Hello, pretty standard stuff. Now what I'm going to do is run npx tsc. I'm going to run the TypeScript compiler. You can see it made a JavaScript file out of that. And the JavaScript file is identical because I'm not using any TypeScript language features. But what I can do here is now uh, test this. So node build test.js and I have a hello. So, okay, my project's working a little bit. Um, I have TypeScript, I have TypeScript console, compilation. Uh, so now what I want to do is I actually want to play with Terso a little bit. So what I'm going to do is um, install the libsql client package. This is going to take a little bit because uh, it's going to have to compile something, um, which takes a little longer than a normal package install. What, what libsql client does for you is it gives you an API to access Terso, well, access libsql, which is Terso, right? When you're accessing Terso, you're also accessing the underlying libsql uh, database on it. And when this eventually happens, um, now I'm going to have in my package JSON, I'm going to have libsql client. Okay, so let's back to the source code. Um, I need to import that. Um, so you can see now my IDE, because I'm using TypeScript, my IDE is giving me all kinds of autocomplete, which is great. Now I need the create client function, first of all. So what I'm going to do here is uh, I'm going to create a function called main. And I'm going to call it, whoops. And inside the function, actually, I'm going to make it async. Um, I don't know how much you learned about async programming. You probably had to learn something about promises. Um, I'm going to use async await syntax to manage all my promises. Uh, so the first thing I'm going to do is create client. And it takes a config object. And you can see that there are two things here, a URL and an auth token. Uh, so I'm going to create both of those right now. Now, how do I get a URL and an auth token? Uh, well, the Terso CLI can do that for me. So I'm going to do Terso uh, DB show demo. What that's going to give me is some information about that demo database I created. So here's the URL. This URL is derived from the name of my uh, GitHub account, which I've already signed in. I didn't show you that part. The, the uh, Terso CLI requires that you sign in with GitHub. Uh, anyway, I'm going to copy that URL here. This is a libsql URL. Um, you're probably used to things like HTTP or HTTPS, or even, I think MongoDB even has its own scheme. We have our own scheme. Uh, this is basically saying use a WebSocket behind the scenes on a certain port. Uh, but generally speaking, you use the libsql URL. Um, you can also see it, the show uh, command showed our database instances. So it made a primary instance with a randomly generated name. Um, and this particular instance has its own URL too. I don't want the instance URL. I want the logical database URL. This is the this URL will route me to the closest instance of my database. And I only have one right now in Chicago, uh, which is okay. But I also need a token. So I need to do terso db tokens create. Um, and I want an expiration of none in this case. So I have this big old token. This is actually a, a, a JOT, a JWT, JSON web token. Uh, that shouldn't really matter too much to you, but uh, suffice to say, if you want to connect, you need a URL and an auth token. So once I have this client, um, what I can do with it is client, and I have a bunch of methods here. So I can do a batch, um, I can do a transaction, but what I really want to do is just execute a single command. Um, and now I'm now I can do SQL. So I can do select star from users. Um, and that's going to return a um, result set. Actually, it's going to return a promise that contains a result set. So you can see now I have a, a result set object. That result set contains the results of the select. So um, actually what I'm going to do here is actually just console log result set. Console log will format that nicely. Okay, so let's see if this works. I'm going to do, first of all, I'll compile the TypeScript, and also I'm going to node uh, run the um, test.js after it's built. And you can see, so there it is. So uh, we have the three columns that I created, the two rows that I added earlier. And I noticed that this program isn't terminating. Um, I'm going to have to use control C to terminate it. The reason why it's not terminating is that the client has created a WebSocket. And that WebSocket is actually keeping the process alive. If I want to terminate normally, 
Um, I should use a try catch. Yeah. Actually, I should use a try finally. And I should um, I should close the client. That will shut down all the resources. Um, actually, I should also catch for that matter. And uh, con console actually error E. So now I'm catching error. So if this execute were to fail, it would go here and log the error. Uh, but in either case, I'm going to close the client at the end of it. So if I run that again, it should it should actually yeah. So the the program terminated with the same results. Okay, so I've already I've set up a database and I've queried it. I'm pretty easy to get there so far. Um, what else can I do? Um, instead of executing a select, what if I wanted to add a row? So I can say uh, await client um, execute. I can do a insert. I could add a new row. So insert into, you actually know what I'll do is an update. I'll do update users set coins equal to 10. Actually, my Zoom is in the way now. Um, where UID equals um, 001. Okay. And I won't bother showing the results set here. So when I run this, it should update the user. So now you don't see the result. Now what I'm going to do is add the select back in and run the select. Oh, that didn't work because I commented out the console log. OK, so now you can see that um, user ID 001 now has 10 coins. Uh, so this is all great. There's only so much you can do in a node program. Um, I believe in your class, you learned Express.js. Uh, so why don't we just go ahead and create a little application server that uses Terso. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll npm install uh, Express. And I'll create a new source file. I'll call it uh, server.ts. And I'll import. Um, Express. Now, TypeScript is giving me some squiggly lines here. Uh, it says it could not find the declaration module for this file. That's just saying that Express doesn't have TypeScript bindings built into it, but it's giving me a suggestion for how to get those TypeScript bindings. So I am just going to run that command as is. And now all of a sudden, the squiggly lines go away, and now I know what Express is. So Express is uh, an instance of Express. So um, let's see if I express. Um, actually, I think it's const, the normal thing is const app equals express, so I can create a new express app, and that app lets me do things like uh, get, and I can do app listen to listen on a port. I'm going to leave get alone from now, and I'm just going to listen. Actually, I'm going to listen on port 8000, and I can give it a callback to say, um, Console log this 8,000. So now I should have, if I run this, I should have an express app listening on port 8,000, but it's not going to do anything because there are no routes to find. So I'll um, create a route called users. And uh, what I'll do is, I'll, right now I'll just, um, comes with a request and a response. I'll just take the response and send, Okay, for now. So what I'll do next is I should pull up another shell. Ooh, it's it's tight. Uh, I don't know. This isn't good. It's easier if my font is smaller. Um, let's do, I'll go ahead and run this. So it's compiling and listening on port 8000. I'll pull up another shell. Um, and I'll use curl. I don't know if you learned curl. Curl is basically the ability, gives you the ability to make HTTP commands uh, right from the command line. So what I'll do is I'll access localhost 8000 users route. And you can see it gave me the okay that I expected. So my express server is up and running and sending responses on the users route. Uh, so now what I want to do is instead of sending okay, I actually want to query the database and uh, return data from it. Um, so I'll just copy, I don't want the stuff from build, I want the stuff from test. So I need this line. 
and I need this line. I'll create a client, and I'm going to sort of borrow this whole try catch. Finally, put it inside the route. Now I don't want to close the client at the end here. I actually want to leave it open for as long as the server is running. Uh, so I, I don't want to. I don't want that. Finally, um, I need to make this async. So I can use async await syntax. And I'm going to go ahead and execute the same command. Instead of console logging, I want to response send a JSON. So res.json, what that'll do is encode the result set object as JSON and send it back to the client. So this should work. Actually, this shouldn't be. This should be res send. Uh, what is it? Oh, I forget what it is. Um, send status 500. So it's like a server error. All right. So let's go back to this one. We need to restart it, re rebuild it, and restart it. Go back to this shell. Do curl localhost. Ah, there we go. It all just appeared. Uh, in fact, I'm going to pipe this to JQ, which is a JavaScript or a, a JSON formatter. So you can see it a little bit better. So you can see. This is exactly what we got in the node program on test.js. We have the three columns of our database, the two rows, each with their column definitions, um, and exactly the same data the way we left it. All right, so we have a, a, a simple express app that knows how to fetch. Um, but fetching by itself is kind of boring, so I want to add a new route to that. Um, what should I do? I'm going to do add user. So with add user, I think what I'll do is execute a um, insert into users values. Now I need to decide what happens with each of these values. So I have three values I need to add, a, a user ID, an email, and a number of coins. Um, I could hard code them all in here, but I'd really rather make this more like an API call where you can specify the values. Um, I think what I'll do here is I'll use something called placeholder SQL. Uh, databases typically allow you to parameterize your request. So uh, if, if I have a command that takes three values, I can just put the values as question marks and then bind them to values uh, that I specify separately. So what I'm going to do is use a version of execute that takes an object. And this object allows me to specify the SQL and allows me to specify the arguments. So these are the values that will get bound. So if I, I could do one, two, three, and that would be, and that would map to one, two, three, but that, that's not what I want at all. Um, what I want is a random user ID. So I can do um, random UUID, I think is a good choice. What random UUID will do is generate what's called a universally unique identifier, which is a kind of a long string of like alphanumeric characters, pretty much guaranteed to be unique. Um, I want an email address and I'm gonna start them off with zero coins, but how do I get an email address? Uh, I think I'm going to use the request object. So, uh, so request has a thing called the query string. Um, and what I want to do is pull an email address out of it. So if I say const email equals that. Now, there's still a problem here. Email says, so TypeScript is saying email can be a string or a parsed query string or a string array or an array of parse queries. I, I don't, I don't, I, it's, it doesn't know what it is and it's in this argument or this API won't take it. So what I need to do is uh, ensure that it's definitely just a string. Uh, so what I can do here is if email is not, actually if type of email is not equal string. So what this is doing is saying, this is going down to JavaScript and saying, hey, JavaScript, does email isn't a string, do something special. Um, what I can do in here is just say res send I don't know, 400 error return. That's an error. Um, but as a part of doing this, TypeScript has now ensured that email is definitely a string at this point. You'll notice that the error went away and TypeScript says, okay, now I know this is string. You checked for it. It's definitely a string now. Okay. So I'll go ahead and save that. Hope that it works. Restart the server. Now I want to construct a query that's going to add this new user. So the route is called add user. So I'll just copy that in there. And the query string is always uh, specified after the question mark. So email equals hope this works. 
very, very, um, very optimistic. I'm going to run that. And it, it gave me the result set. You notice that the for the insert, it returned no rows and com columns, but the rows affected value is one because it added one row, uh, which is very, very optimistic. Now, if we go back and look at the users route again, we should expect to see that that um, third user in there. And we sure do. So we have user one with 10 coins, user two with zero coins, and the new user with the random user ID, the email address I specified, and the default value of zero coins. So um, I'm pretty well on my way to making a what's called a CRUD app, right? Where you just do create, read, update, delete kind of operations. Um, pretty easy to set up, right? Terso made it pretty easy. All I had to do was run the Terso CLI to create a database, issue SQL statements to it, wire that up into an Express app. Um, and so far, so good. So yeah. And that's the end of my demo. Um, does anyone actually, no, that's not the end of my demo. I'm going to do one more thing. Uh, remember the Terso DB show demo. It showed us, I have one primary database. What I wanted, what if I found out that I had users in another part of the world? Um, let's just say they're in San Jose. Remember that map where we had people in uh, Canada and some in uh, Florida, or I'm sorry, California. So what I wanna do is take that SJC. I wanna do Terso DB repli replicate demo uh, location SJC. And I believe that should, oh, I did it wrong. Uh, Terso DB replicate demo, oh, it, it, it's, you don't specify a location flag. So this is gonna to replicate to San Jose. And it's crawling right up the screen. There's a bug. <laughs> I actually filed a bug in the Terso CLI repo for that crawling up behavior. Anyway, you can see that it created a new replica. It has its own URL if you wanted to correct, connect directly to it. And it also has a shell URL uh, where you can connect directly to that replica. In fact, I'm gonna run that. I'm gonna connect you to the shell directly to the replica and select star from, uh, from users. And sure enough, all the data is there, um, just like in the primary. And now if I do the Terso show demo, you'll see that I have a primary in Chicago and a replica in San Jose. So you can connect to the either one directly um, and get the exact same data. Now, again, if you use this libsql URL, um, this, this what we call a logical database URL, no matter where you are in the world, it will find the closest instance to you. So for me, I'm always going to go to Chicago while I'm here in um, uh, while I'm here in Cleveland. If you were to access this database, you'd end up at the San Jose. Um, uh, location. So anyway, and you can keep replicating to your heart's content. Um, the free tier actually limits you to three databases, including replicas. If you were on more of an enterprise plan or, you know, the eventual paid plan, you can create as many replicas as you're willing to pay for. And the payment, I believe, is based on your total amount of data you use. So like, you know, basically the sum of the data of the of all of the tables that you've got in there, um, and also how many rows you read out of it. So you're paying per use, basically you're paying for storage, and you're paying for the queries that read rows. And now that's the end of my demo. So <laughs> sorry for the for the false end there. Um, and if you have any more questions, I'd be happy to take those. Yeah, perfect timing. We have about ten minutes left of uh, class in this classroom, so. If anyone has any questions about the demo or even from the presentation before, we'd be happy to take 